typewriter. Mm -hmm. And it was, the way it was done was just the way it should have been done. They, they wanted okay. Today is October the 30th, 1987. My name is Rebecca Sharpless and I'm interviewing for the first time Debbie Jean Seagraves. The interview is taking place at Ms. Seagraves' home, 5719 Forest Drive in Ackworth, Georgia. I'm interviewing Ms. Seagraves as a part of a project on working women in Atlanta for the ILA at Emory University. Debbie, I appreciate so much your letting me come up this morning. I enjoy, I, this is a new trip to me to Cherokee County and I'm glad to be here. Well, you're very welcome. I enjoy the visit. Well, good. And I'd like to start out just real generally today by ask you, um, when did you first get started in office work? About about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. I've been in the job market for a long time, but I've only been doing office work for about eight years. And when I started, it wasn't just office work that I was doing. I was working for a veterinary clinic, and I was also working as a veterinary assistant and doing um, mm -hmm. office work. Just based on the short time I've seen you, I can see why you would be wonderful in a veterinary shop. I, it was a lot of fun, and I did. I started out doing receptionist work, receptionist filing, like typing, that sort of thing. And then by the time I left, I was also doing payroll and uh, minor bookkeeping, inventory control, and that sort of thing. So it was just something I evolved into. Uh, it was amazing how much of the administrative work that was necessary for restaurant management, which is what I did before, just pertained to clerical work. Mm -hmm. um, clerical workers really have to know a lot more than you think because I found that um, doing a P&L and that sort of thing in a restaurant. Which is? Uh, what's P&L? A profit and loss statement. Um, you turn around and you use that in clerical work, in accounting, bookkeeping. So in the restaurants it was considered a management skill and in an office it's considered clerical skills. But it's the same skill, it's the same knowledge, it just pays less. Mm -hmm. what, was, um, what was your day like at the veterinary clinic? How did that? Well, it, it varied. I was there for about a year and a half. When I first started, it was strictly receptionist. I came in, um, I took telephone calls, I scheduled appointments, I made new files for new customers. I, I, pulled files for the pending customers. Um, they didn't call them customers, they called them clients uh, because the customer was the dog. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. or the patient. Um, then you would um, attach any um, new paperwork that the doctor had written up to the file and refile it. Uh, you would type, um, type new files, you would do some light typing for the doctors, letters, that sort of thing. Um, make telephone calls for him, uh, keep a telephone log for him, keep a log of um, prescriptions, do deposits, and that sort of thing. And it, it changed over a period of time um, when he found that I knew how to do payroll because I had done payroll before. Then I started doing the payroll and they eventually hired another receptionist and I started learning more and more about being being an assistant. I was actually um, assisting in surgery and um, filling prescriptions, doing injections, drawing blood, doing simple lab tests, that sort of thing. And then in the afternoons doing paperwork. I would do an inventory, I would do the ordering, that sort of thing. When you first started, how many people were working the clinic? Not counting the doctors. Uh, well, how many doctors were there? There were two all the time and three sometimes. Um, they would take on interns and they would, or they call them externs. Why, I don't know. But they would take on um, young doctors and they would be there for a while. And then they had different doctors come in for short periods and then move on. Uh, they did open another branch while I was there. And the, the paperwork was shared. The one office did the paperwork for, the, for both. 
Um, there were two receptionists working part-time at the beginning, and then it changed to one. Uh, there was me, there was a lab technician, uh, a surgical assistant, two or three counter people. It was it was a fairly small operation and, and it stayed about the same the whole time I was there. And how many people were in the office? Five or six, just a, just according it varied back and forth. I mean the clerical end of The clerical end? Mm hmm Just a receptionist and me. So um, how many how often were you in the office by yourself? Never. Never. What kind of telephone system did they have? They had a very simple old time um, push button, two incoming lines, um, and a hold button. Um, it had an intercom, but it was just the old time AT&T regular telephone. And the buttons crossed the bottom? Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind we all grew up with. Yeah, hardly anybody has those anymore. Uh, the the telephone systems now are amazing. What you can do with them, they're wonderful. Um, some of them are. I've had some that would drive you crazy. Mm -hmm. Me too. But the new Merlin systems, just great. That was the last company that I've worked I worked at had a Merlin system. And the intercom on it's very easy to use. I mean, it it can make your life very pleasant to have a good phone system. What about the filing? Was there anything special about that? Um, at the at the veterinary clinic, the only particular thing that was was special about the filing um, was that when you you set up new cards, when you set up a new file for a new animal. And that animal received shots. You had to make a reminder card and file it to be mailed out in a year. And you also had to keep track of the rabies shots because that is something that's very important. Um, when a dog gets a rabies shot, uh, he's given a tag with a number and you have to uh, write up a form saying this dog got a shot on this day and was issued this tag number and they had to be kept numerically and and filed by the date so that if indeed this dog bit someone six months from now, you could go back and pull that and verify that this dog was the correct dog. You know, they they hadn't gotten one shot and put the, put the tag on someone else, mm -hmm. that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So that was something that was important to keep. I never thought about that, but it makes sense. Yeah, if you're bitten by a dog and they have a tag on, you can pull that number, and uh, the forms are issued by the state, uh, and the tags are that this this dog had this shot, and you can just go back and make sure that its shots are current. And they have a description like. They have, there's a description of the animal on the form. I hadn't thought about that. What about the typing that was involved in you? Very light typing. No, um, no kind of speed limit on it. Um, the only thing is if you had very, very busy times, you might have a lot of files to type at one time. But the, the typing involved was, was mostly just um, a set file. You know, it had a form on the front of it, the animal's name, the owner's name, um, the description of the animal, and the address and phone number of the owner and it was just folded and then everything that that dog's history or that cat's history was in that file um, every time a client brought an animal in you pull that file out you put it in the waiting room for the doctor so that he could excuse me so that he could review the history of the animal before he went in um, especially if it's an ongoing condition that sort of thing very simple filing, you know, everything done just alphabetically by the owner's name. What sort of um, equipment did you have to type on? I don't remember the brand. I think it was an old Royal. It was a... I don't remember for sure if it was manual or if it was just a very simple electric. I believe that it was a manual. Come to think of it, we started with a manual and did get a, a used electric one. Um, 
it was basically all that was necessary for the job because there was just not that much typing done. Um, occasional letters for the doctors, very occasional. Um, they didn't do a lot of that. How was the transition from manual to electric? Well, it, the transition from electric to manual was harder because I had typed before on an electric. And uh, then to go back to using a manual was very hard. I had very little experience on a manual. And, uh, but we're talking about eight, eight or nine years ago. I'm, yeah, late 70s. Yeah, and, and so we we really weren't into the very good electronic typewriters right then. Just to have an electric typewriter was wonderful. What did you use for corrections? Um, liquid paper. I believe it was liquid paper. No, no, we had the little correct type. The little slide. The little slide in, the little correct type. The little tab that you slide in mm -hmm. and get the correction. Mm -hmm. It's a big improvement over liquid paper, I think. Yeah, yeah. Probably at different times we used either, you know, but, but we did have some correct type. I remember the first first typing job I got, I got this little note back from my from my boss that said, uh, please let the liquid paper dry before you try to type <laughs> over it. <laughs> uh-huh. Because it'll trail it to your next three or four times. Yeah, or it just kind of, the character just kind of sinks into mm -hmm. it. And then, it just kind of disappears. But there was not, like I said, the, the typing was a very, very small part of that job. Um, toward the end, when I started doing payroll, there was more clerical work involved in it. But that job was mostly not clerical. Mm -hmm. it, you had some clerical duties, but they really weren't the major part of it. How do you keep a telephone log? A telephone log? You when see. you mean for the doctors, uh -huh. oh, just just a list of the the people that have called in. That was all we had to do there. Um, I've in other jobs I've had to keep a better, more detailed telephone log. But for the veterinarians, all you had to do was during the day they would not talk to you. They were with clients. They were with patients. So when people called in and wanted to talk to the doctor, you just kept a list of Mrs. Jones called at ten fifteen regarding this problem. Mm -hmm and um, you would try to find out what it was concerning, which animal it was concerning, so you could pull the file and give it to him so that after he had seen the last client for the day or for the morning, and he would make calls at lunch, that he had the files. Mm -hmm. When you left the vet shop, where did you go? I went to a heating and air conditioning company, Cherokee Heating and Air Conditioning. And that was in June of 1980. And uh, I went to work there <clears throat> as a dispatcher, is what they told me. When I went to work, I was supposed to be taking service calls, scheduling service technicians, trucks around Atlanta. And um, um, basically, that was supposed to be it. When I got there, I found that there was a stack of paperwork that was behind probably two feet high and that's not an exaggeration I mean about two feet high a stack of paperwork that I had never seen um, things like invoices where a service technician had gone out and done service at a home and he had used parts parts I had never seen that I had to cost and make um, make entries on these invoices to prepare them as source documents for computer entry. Did they tell you that this paperwork was your responsibility when they hired you? No, and that's funny because I was hired on a baseball field. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me. The person that uh, hired me was coaching my son's baseball team, and I was like. The, the baseball commissioner for a recreation association and he was a coach and I had gotten him to coach I was a friend of his wife's and he kept coming to, to practice late 
and I asked him what was wrong, and he said, well, he had to fire his dispatcher, and he was having to do it himself, and so he's late getting out every day. And this went on for three or four weeks, and he had been without a dispatcher for this whole period of time. And I was working at the veterinary clinic at the time, and I was making $4.10 an hour at the veterinary clinic. And um, I was ready to make a little more money. And um, anyway, I asked him, was he looking for somebody? And he said, yes, and I just haven't even had time to interview anybody. And, and the few people I've interviewed, I don't think they could do it because you need somebody that's real good with customers and they need an adult. So we talked about it, and I told him I was looking for a job, or I was thinking about making a change, and uh, he hired me. I asked him what was involved, and he told me all the stuff about dispatching and service calls and um, learning the city and learning the zip code area so that you could keep one truck in the same area to cut down travel time and that sort of thing. And he said, and you will do the invoices too. That was it. You'll do the invoices too. And I said, well, you know, what, what's involved in the invoices? Oh, you mail them out for bills and that sort of thing. And that's all he told me. And, and he really wasn't being dishonest with me. He had no idea what was involved, how much was involved in doing the paperwork because it wasn't something he had ever done. When he fired her, it just started backing up. So that when I went to work there, we had an entire month's billings to be done. They were just sitting there. There were checks for one, two, three, four, five hundred dollars in these invoices just sitting there. Hadn't been deposited. All these accounts receivables? Uh-huh. All these. Well, no, these were like COD. Uh, uh -huh. When a serviceman comes to your house, he repairs your air conditioner, you pay him, he puts the check in an invoice, and at the end of the week, he turns in the invoices. So, you know, he'll be carrying that check around for up to seven days. Um, there were three weeks worth of those. There was probably, oh, $10,000 just sitting there in checks that nobody, you know, nobody was doing anything with it. And, uh, when I came to work there, I found the job was a lot more than we had thought, or that I had thought, and really more than he thought. He didn't really know how much was involved. And um, it took a long time to ever get it caught up, especially since I didn't know what I was doing when I started. A lot of it I just had to figure out. There was another woman in the office, the bookkeeper, who did know what she needed because she did the computer entry but she didn't really know where to get the information. Um, my service manager, the one that hired me, Carlin, was very seldom in the office. A lot of it I just had to find out on my own. Uh, a lot of trial and error, a lot of calling supply houses and asking how much things cost. Um, there was no list of how much things cost. There was no list of how much to charge for most things. Service technicians would go out, they would put in a motor, and they would call and say, how much do I charge for this? Uh, well, I don't know. I'll find out. And then you have to find somebody who knows what the gross profit margin is supposed to be. Does anybody know how much we're supposed to mark these up? It was like going into something you had never thought about. It wasn't that you didn't know anything about it. You never even thought about it. It never occurred to me what was involved in repairing an air conditioner. I didn't even have one. So it was very difficult uh, to start with. Um, I finally worked it out. Mostly worked it out by myself. It took a long time to ever get caught up, but we did get caught up. How did you squeeze the invoicing in between <clears throat> the dispatching? You didn't. You waited until you finished and then you worked late. They did hire a receptionist and I don't really think they hired a receptionist because I was new they hired a receptionist because it was June of 1980 and if you weren't in Georgia you don't know but you were in Texas it was the hottest summer on record ever mm -hmm. for the longest period of time mm -hmm. and um, it was just something new in air conditioning and I didn't know this was new I thought it was always this way 
But I came in and immediately started answering the phone and started getting cussed out. You know, customers would cuss me out. Where is my motor? I've been waiting three weeks on it. I've been without air conditioning for three weeks, and it's going to be 110 again today. And um, it was like, I didn't know these people. They were already mad at me before I ever opened my mouth. I spent the entire day just answering the phone and taking care of, of service technicians and their needs. And then afterwards, I would try to do paperwork. So they did hire a receptionist, which took some of it off. And, uh, did she get cussed out then? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of times you can stop that. It's just a matter of saying, I don't know what the problem is, but I'll find out. I just started. So I'm really sorry you've had a problem, but let's see if we can't fix it. So you know, customers will calm down. Um, they're very upset when they're hot. They get nasty when they're hot. But Especially usually, a summer like that one. Yeah. Usually if you act as if you care and that you will try to help, then they'll calm down. The people who don't calm down are the service technicians who are working 12 hours a day in that heat. Because when they get there, there's no air conditioning. So they're always hot. But it was a rough summer. And uh, we did get it straightened out, though. And I was there for over four years. Okay. You said that they had a bookkeeper. Mm hmm And she had a computer. Mm hmm Sort of. It was a sort of a computer. <laughs> it was a system called FAX, which was a system set up by a company in Florida. Florida the FAX? F-A-C-S. Florida Air Conditioning Systems. Ah, okay. And, uh... What she had was just like a little terminal, and it wasn't connected to anything. She, she made entries for all of the company's bookkeeping. She made entries for her receivables, her payables. She made entries for her payroll, uh, entries for all of the service invoices that I processed, all of the money that was deposited, and it was recorded on little tapes. Like and little cassette tapes? Just little cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the month, when she had made all of her entries, she would mail them to Florida. And they would put them on their mainframe and run out all of our books. Hmm. And mail our books back. But now that meant that all of her checks she did manually. Okay, all of my source documents and everything were done manually. What do you mean manually? Her checks. She just, just wrote checks. Um and then made the entries into the computer on the tape. When she did payroll, she, we did payroll manually on, on one of these, um, a pegboard system. How does that work? You're uh, talking to somebody who's never done any payroll. Okay, a pegboard system is where you have checks that have a, a carbon strip on them. Mm -hmm. And you have um, a card for each employee and then you have a master payroll card. And they all line up with pegboards so that you have your your master uh, payroll card for the week, and then you put this this individual's payroll card over it, line it up with the pegs, and then you put a check over it. Okay, so you make one entry. You you figure manually all of the payroll deductions and everything, and you make one entry across there, and it makes the entry on the check, on the in, employee's individual card, and then on the week's master payroll. So at the end of the week, or at the end of that payroll, you add up all of your taxes deducted and everything, and your Social Security, the FICA deducted, and your gross payroll and your net payroll. And then at the end of the quarter, you add up the, the employees on their card, and you have all your payroll systems there. It's very time consuming. But <clears throat> once these things were done on the pegboard system, then the entry had to be made into the computer to go into the... Um, general accounting system excuse me <clears throat> so it was very time consuming but we got back excellent books i mean the system that came back told you um well it told you everything you could possibly want to know what percentage of your money you were making off of of um say service contracts maintenance contracts um a maintenance contract is something where you go to someone's house and they've got an air conditioning system and a furnace and you say, for this many dollars a year, 
We will do maintenance for you four times a year and we will do repairs. You pay us one time a year. Different ways, uh, they, you just may do maintenance and then they pay you for repairs at a discount. But you take the money that they pay you and you put it into a, a contract reserve and allot it out into 12 sections. And um, then when service is done, it's charged against it. And the computer would send it back, the fax would send it back to us and our books that this contract numbered uh, 4251 has uh, $150 left in reserve. You've used this many dollars on parts, this many dollars on labor, and you've made this much profit on this contract uh, year to date. Just, you know, you got back a lot of figures that really helped you. You could take those and you could say, well, we're not making money on these. We need to go up or it's time to renew and we made money on them last year and we can keep it at the same price. And so you got a lot of good information um, from that system. The problem with it was it was slow. And it didn't give you the option of running your checks in the office on a computer very quickly. As a matter of fact, what we finally did was we were using two different services. We were uh, parceling out the payroll to a, a, a company that did payroll where you called it in and they sent back your checks and they sent back all your records. Would they figure up the FICA? And mm -hmm. Oh yeah, there are, there are companies out there and I don't remember the name of them, but there's many of them. Um, where they'll set up a payroll system for you. All you do is you, you give them all the information. This employee makes this much an hour and this employee has this many deductions and they put all of that on their computer. And then every week all you do is you call them up and you give them uh, employee number one had 40 hours, employee number two had 52 hours, employee number three salary, employee number four salary. And uh, <clears throat> they would take it and usually the next day you get a check back get your checks back by uh, messenger so we had two systems then we had the fax system that we sent off for our general accounting books and then the payroll system um, for the company that did our payroll let me take a second and turn the tape over mm -hmm. oh no we got a little got a few minutes left i can't see the dark tape mm -hmm. but um when you you say you did invoices, that means you prepared them. Okay, the system on that was you um, you had printed invoices, blank invoices, and the service technicians were allotted a certain number of invoices, um, and they were logged so that this invo this service technician on this date got twenty five invoices numbered one through twenty four or one through twenty five, and. Um, they would go out to the to the home or to the business where they were doing service and they would in most cases they would do a complete invoice they would figure the parts you know their amount of time on the job charge the customer for it either get a check or a signature leave a copy um, they would bring them back into the office at just according to how many times you brought them into the office you didn't bring them in every day at the beginning at the end i had to um, they would bring you back a stack of invoices and that was their also their time cards because the invoices said they went they left for this job at 8 they got there at 8 30 they left at 9 30 the next invoice would say they left at 9 30 they got there at 10 and they left at 11. so i would get the invoices in and for each service technician i would sit down with a time sheet which was actually just a ledger sheet and put on monday the first um, mm -hmm this invoice number, this customer name, this many hours um, for each day. There might be five, six, seven for a day. On some, in some cases there would be one invoice for a day. In some cases there could be as many as ten. But that was how I did their payroll. That was how I determined their payroll dollars, uh, their payroll hours. And then I would take their rate and manually figure the dollars allotted to each invoice for costing purposes. Okay, at the end of the week, I would give that sheet, a copy of that sheet. I would turn it in for payroll for the, for the technician to be paid. This determined how many hours he'd worked that week. And I would keep a copy of it and take all of his invoices and cost them out. Which involves? Involve taking the hours from this payroll sheet, mm -hmm. multiplied by his rate, mm -hmm. determining regular time or overtime, 
and put that cost on the invoice against labor dollars. You've got your, your labor cost and your um, what you charge, mm -hmm. your labor price. Mm -hmm. And then you would take the list of any of the equipment or parts that he had used and you would cost that, determine how much it cost us. As opposed to how much you charge. As opposed to how much you charge. And you would figure a gross profit. Now this was just a gross profit. Right, didn't include overhead or transportation. Included nothing. Okay, if there was billing to be done, these are like four part invoices. Uh, the first one was probably left on the job with a customer. The second one would be mailed to a customer as a bill. Okay, if it was to be billed. If it wasn't COD. If it, if, correct, if it weren't COD. If it were COD, you'd just throw that copy away. If it were to be billed, you would bill it out. Uh, just simply mail the invoice to them, to the customer, and then you would log it on your receivables manually. Now, there was a computer printed receivables, but remember, we're mailing these things off, and there's a six weeks to an eight week delay on getting back all of your computer forms because if if this invoice had been done on January the 1st you didn't mail off your tapes until sometime in the first week of February or maybe the middle of February and it might not come back to you till the end of February with a printed accounts receivable so you had to keep a manual accounts receivable so that when these customers paid you knew where to apply the check. Mm. Hang on just a second, let's mm -hmm. turn the recorder. Okay, so to continue, you would manually log your accounts receivable. Now these, these started to almost 20 when I left uh, but let's just say 10 and they're going to do on the average of five a day but 50 invoices a day five or six days a week so you're talking about quite a lot of paperwork okay so we're to the to the point now where we have logged our, our accounts receivable manually and turned our invoices in then a check comes in someone has paid their bill you have to take a, a a computer document, just, just a, a piece of paper with bars and columns, and sit down and write, this check came in, you had to log the customer's name, the account number to which it should be applied, which by the way, when that customer became a customer, we had to assign him an account number. The invoice number to which it needs to be applied, and the amount. So that's just your source document. Then you make a deposit slip for it to go to the bank. And now that's just one kind of invoice that we've just taken care of. If it was a COD invoice, you go through the same steps except you don't ha you make your deposit at the same time as you process your invoice. But it does have to be done differently. You have COD deposit and you have accounts receivable deposits. Then you had other invoices which was where there were no charges involved, where you had, say, a maintenance contract customer, as we discussed before, where you still have to cost it out, but there's no billing involved. And you cost it out so that it can be applied against the service contract reserve when the computer entries are made. Then you have warranty calls, which have to be costed out and applied against warranty reserve. And then you have installation type work, which is um, costed out and applied against a job number, an installation number. So you had five different kinds of invoices that you processed, and it was a constant thing. It was every day. You did something on them every day. And then there were deadlines because you had to get finished at a certain time so that you, know, you had to be finished at a certain day so that payroll could be out at a certain time. 
and then you had to have other things finished up at the end of the month so that your monthly figures could, could go in. Was payroll weekly? Payroll was weekly. And so you, you did your payroll. You could do your payroll and then lay those invoices to the side and come back to them. But you still had to figure your dollars and your hours so that payroll could go in. So you've done all this, and then you have to sort these invoices out uh, when you give them to her to put in the computer. You have to have all of your accounts receivable ones in one stack, uh, and then you have all your accounts pay uh, uh, your CODs in one stack, and then all of your service contracts in one stack, and all of your um, warranties in one stack because they don't go in on the same program on the computer. So you have to sort them for her so that she can sit down with one stack and put them in on that program. Um, and then when she's done, she gives them back. And you have to file all those invoices alphabetically by street. By street? By street, yeah, because this is heating and air conditioning and, and the customers within a, an area may change or within a house, but the house stays at the same place. So the history of the equipment is done alphabetically by street. So now you've got a file where you've got, and, and the filing was just tremendous. Oh, I mean, just, I mean, go back to those numbers. We've got uh, 50 invoices generated a day on the average, up to 100 invoices a day when we had almost 20 men. Um, five days a week, each one of these has to be filed. You're just talking about a tremendous amount of filing. How long would it take you on average to file? Well, as soon as they hired, what? Well, until they hired a receptionist, I never did any filing. It just stayed in a stack. You never got to it. You know, sometimes you would um, sort a little bit, but there was probably a good two hours a day spent filing. Uh, one or the other of us would do it. You didn't really do it that way because you got it all back in a stack. And you would just try to file it. But you didn't get it, you know. It was just amazing, the amount of filing. Um... And the company was growing. They were in a real growth period, and they were adding people all along. So after the first three or four months, I didn't do a lot of filing. I didn't have time to do a lot of filing. Other people did it, but it was constant. There was always something to be filed, always, because you had the ones alphabetically, and then you had the ones numerically. And the reason you had it both ways was because if a customer called in, they would say, I have a question about invoice uh, 5241. You don't want to have to ask their address. You don't want to have to go through all that. And besides which, it's probably not filed yet. Mm -hmm. You know? But if you have a numerical file, you can file those quickly. They don't take long. And then you can just go to that numerical file and flip through it. So you had double filing. You had double filing. And it was necessary to have double filing because you needed to look up the information both ways. Anyway, that was the way it was, say, for the first year that I was there maybe 18 months, and then things started to change. The systems changed. Well, let's talk about that. Okay. The bookkeeper, whose name was Jan, decided that there was just too much paperwork. She was right. <laughs> There's something needed to be done. There was too long a delay on the system that we had, and we needed a computer, an in-house computer which I had agreed, you needed an in-house computer. At that, by that time... This would have been 81, 82? Um, 82, sometime in 82. Okay, by that time, the office staff had increased. When I first started there, there was Jan and there was me. Okay. Shortly after that, we hired a receptionist, and that was Kim. Um, and Kim was just an excellent excellent worker good on the telephone good at filing you know could get things done quickly always stayed busy and we haven't even gotten into purchase orders yet yeah. kim took those on um it, purchase orders packing slips matching up matching the invoices the whole payables thing but anyway we had increased also by that time to one additional person who was doing generally helping me and there was some switching back and forth there was an idea at one time that i would do all the paperwork they would hire a dispatcher and that wasn't what they wanted to do so i went back to being a dispatcher and they hired someone to to help with the paperwork um or basically to do the invoices because by that time we had about 15 technicians and just my telephone duties 
were outrageous. Anyway. Now, would Kim take the service calls or would you? No, Kim answered the telephone. And put the service calls to you? The service calls went to me and then she would, you know, transfer calls from, um, um, to salespeople right. or to the owner or to the service manager or whoever. There were a lot of people there. This was, it was considered a small business, but there were a lot of people there because there were three or four salespeople and then the owner and an installation manager and a service manager and uh, anywhere from seven to 20 service technicians according to the time and then installers and then a warehouse man you know so there were this was a a fairly large operation payroll of 30 to 40 um or more it, 30 to 40 probably when i started and then it increased um most of the people worked in the installation department but it was just all one company um, okay, so where were we? We had added people on. So we had added someone named Jerry, um, a woman named Jerry. And she was doing the bulk of the service paperwork. Not all of it, but the bulk of it. I was still doing the payroll portion. Uh, she was preparing the invoices. Jan was doing the bookkeeping. And Kim was doing a lot of things. Uh, answering the phone, filing, doing purchase orders. Um, just just generally helping everybody and um, <clears throat> at this point they decided that we had just outgrown the computer system we had we needed an in-house computer and there was nobody there that knew anything about in-house computers except Jan knew a little bit and so what they did was they called IBM and this is this is no knock on IBM because I think IBM has a lot of good equipment and a lot of good people but the fact was I don't think we knew what we wanted and IBM, the people, actually the people you get are not actually people from IBM. And I don't understand the whole system, but it's like this is a software company that sells you software and pushes IBM equipment. Mm -hmm. So they didn't actually know anything at all about heating and air conditioning. And so Jan, the bookkeeper, and these people from this software company decided on a system. And the system was bought and put in and working before anybody ever discussed it with me. No one asked me any questions. No one asked me how much was involved in preparing source documents or Jerry. No one asked her. No one consulted with us at all. Okay. It was bought and put in. And it was held for a year. I mean, absolute hell. That's the only way I can describe it. Because Jan would sit down, and Jan was already behind. She was behind was the reason we decided to get a computer. She didn't know anything about computers. The man who sold her the computer didn't know anything about heating and air conditioning. So she had to make her own application. Mm hmm And instead of cutting down the work, it doubled it doubled it easy because they bought a system that was not it did not have enough capacity for the work that we needed done um, we we're already we, we were already in a system where I was making source documents let's say for instance I prepared an invoice as I described it before she could enter it in the computer in one sitting now she did have to split up and you know enter all of the receivables separately the COD separately, the service contract separately. Now she had to, to make two separate list uh, series of entries for each of those because she didn't get a system that would interface. When she made, um, prior to this on the fax system, when she sat down and she took an accounts receivable invoice, okay, she made an entry on for material cost, she made an entry for labor cost. Well, that automatically interfaced with her general accounting system. And it accounted for that many payroll dollars and accounted for that many inventory dollars. On the new system, it didn't interface. So she had to take, make two entries. She had to make entries into the billing, the receivables for this invoice, and she also had to make entries on the general accounting system. And she didn't know to find out that it would do that or that it wouldn't do that. 
So she was making double entries or triple entries in some cases because now we go to the service contract invoices where you have to go back and take it out of reserve and then you also have to account for the payroll dollars. Now, when they got the computer mm. system, did they switch off the fax system completely? Mm -hmm. They went over, they did double duty two months. And then they just sent the piece of equipment back. Because it didn't belong to us, it was something on a lease. Uh, a lease. So, two months she did double duty. And it took probably six months to do that two months. Now, that's no exaggeration. It was like... Uh, we went on in, in January, which was a slow time in the beginning of a new year. I didn't have an accounts receivable till June. I didn't have a printed accounts receivable till June. I didn't have statements to mail to customers till June. How did the company keep functioning without accounts receivable? I was sending out manual. I was doing it manually. They had to have their bills. We would never get paid. So Jerry and I were doing it manually. When you say manually, do you mean on a typewriter or, with, or handwritten? Handwritten bills. Handwritten? Or, well, we didn't send out statements. It wasn't, we didn't send out statements at all. I continued to send out the, the second sheet. The second sheet of the invoice, just as we had been doing before. And then we had our manually written accounts receivable. And all we could do at that point was if a customer was late, you know, just, just track it. Keep, keep track of it yourself and say, look, you know, this is an old one. It's not been paid. Call up a customer. We didn't have any statements to send. <clears throat> and you're not talking about something where you could sit down and, um, wait a minute, I lost my thought, where you could just sit down and manually type up statements and send, it out, send them out. That would have taken forever because when I got statements to finally, we had enough customers, and when I got statements to mail out, it was a book about eight inches high. There were that many to mail. When I got an alphabetical listing of customers, I don't know how many customers there were <clears throat> because I never bothered to count them, but it was like a computer printout three inches thick. That's how many customers we had. So it wasn't something where you could just say, oh, well, I'll just type up some manual and statements and send them out. It would have taken somebody a week. Mm -hmm doing nothing else. Mm -hmm. So we, I mean, it was like a backup you wouldn't believe. How many hours a week were you working at this point? I went in every morning at 7.30. I didn't work many Saturdays. I worked a few Saturdays. But every morning at 7.30, I never left before 5, 5.30, and sometimes I worked until 7 or 7.30. I was, I was working about 60 hours a week. By the way, I was on salary. I wasn't paid a dime's overtime. What about Jan? Jan was not paid overtime. How many hours a week was she working? More than me because she came in on Saturday and Sunday. She, was, she came in after I did, but she was usually there when I left. And I'm going to tell you something, and I'm not just saying this for a dramatic effect. Jan died. Jan had an aneurysm and died in 1984. And... You could watch this woman deteriorate. And she wasn't an easy person to get along with anyway, and there was a lot of friction. And as time got, as it went on, and the system got worse and worse, and she got farther and farther behind, and she was not capable of keeping up. We hadn't had a full set of books at that time in two years. Our bank statement had not been reconciled in six months. She did, she did have one person to help her, but it, you know, it was more than two people could do. And finally, they fired her. And they fired her, and she was to work a month for a transition period. And at the end of the first week of that transition period, she died. I mean, it was like, what a shock. But you'd sit and watch this woman deteriorate. She just took her job so seriously. What age was she? 41 and th it she had health problems she was a diabetic um, that kind of stress on a diabetic was not something that she was able to handle I don't know that anybody could have handled that stress most people would have quit and just walked away from it um, she wasn't that kind of person she couldn't 
and uh, you know you could just watch her and there were several times that we had to just take her home just stop what you were doing and take her home because she couldn't drive and uh, I mean her health just she was always a very slim woman and she probably didn't weigh 90 pounds when she finally left and just I just watched her fall apart but anyway that went on for quite some time I mean it just got worse and worse because our business was growing we were getting busier we were adding people just every time you turn around you were adding another office worker and that office worker would come in and try to do something that was already behind um, so finally I had raised so much hell everybody was raising hell you know we can't give you what you want the computer won't do it and we there's just it's it's too big a job to try to do it manually and the owner of the company just I mean one day it was like okay you're bitching give me some give me some uh, some way to resolve this and I said fine what you need to do is hire somebody to come in and analyze this I don't do it but you don't want to depend on these people selling you the software because they're here to sell you something go find somebody that doesn't want to sell you something they'll tell you it'll wash dishes if they think it'll sell yeah go find someone who knows computers who knows accounting I know they're out there there are people out there that does, that's not here to sell you something they're going to charge you a fee to come in and tell you what you need well, let me back up for a second what was the owner's reaction during this period of chaos oh well he was his blood pressure went through the roof I mean he got very sick too you could tell his stress level was very high because I mean this was his life this was his livelihood depending on it of course it was our livelihood too but our customers were not getting the service they should a customer would call in about a receivables and he'd come back or a customer would call in with a complaint and he would come back and say I need to see this customer's file and I said good luck you know, I probably can get it for you by this time tomorrow you, know, you just I don't want to tell you tell the customer will call him back he was he knew there was a problem but honest to God he didn't know how to handle it he couldn't think what had caused it he blamed it on Jan she bought the wrong computer and she had but then again she didn't know anyway finally and I didn't just say this one time I said this a hundred times we have a problem we're not getting any better we're all going crazy you're turning over office help you know, every week someone comes in here and they say my god I can't handle this and they'll leave um, I have no idea how many customers we lost in that period but finally um, there's another person in the office who was not a clerical worker she was a salesperson but she did her own clerical work that's a little aside the men had clerical workers to do their work she did her own clerical work uh, <laughs> <laughs> but why she, why don't ask me you can ask the EEOC that's where it is now but um, anyway we uh, we talked about it she did know she had some experience in it uh, she had been an excellent clerical worker before she went into sales um, <coughs> we introduced the owner to an accountant who would come in and look over the system uh, evaluate the system uh, evaluate the results that were needed he was had, he was doing accounting for many heating and air conditioning firms he had some experience in it um, we found him and we talked the owner into talking to him and he came in and he went through the system and he interviewed everybody he talked to everybody he came and talked to me what do you have to do what do you need back what do you give the computer what do you get back talk to everyone and did that for a week or so and came in and these were his words because I almost laughed myself to death when I heard it what you need to do is take this system home and let the dog play with it because that's what it's worth 
Now we need to go and find you a system that will do what you need. And they tried to go back through IBM even after he had been told. He the owner? He the owner. Tried to go back through the same company and update this system to do what we needed. He had bought a system that was a floppy disk type thing, um, very limited. It was not a lot more than a PC. And you couldn't even add a hard disk drive to it, was my understanding, not to this system. And what we needed was not possible, wasn't, couldn't possibly be done without a hard disk drive. And you needed three terminals. See, all of this was just one terminal, just one person doing it all. Anyway, to make a long story short, they finally determined they were losing more money than a new system would cost them, and they did get another system in. As they were getting it in, I was leaving. My understanding is they got another system in because I did stay in contact with some people there. They worked on it for a year. Then they got another system because that one wasn't good enough either because they were still trying to get what they needed for less money instead of making the initial investment to go ahead and get what they needed. So they're, as I understand now, they're on their fourth computer system, starting with the SAC system to the IBM PC system to one that was a hard disk drive a little bit larger to the one they're on now. They have, at last count, the last time I talked to anybody that worked there, they have 15 clerical workers. Now, they have probably doubled their business from the time I started there. I'm sure it's doubled. But you're talking about seven times the number of clerical people. Not twice as many, seven times. So that's the story of that company. Well, I did, by the way, steal them from my overtime and get it. Great. Didn't get it all, I got part of it. Oh, let's see. You got 